so I chose this topic because um, I think a lot of people don't see it. Even a lot of the stats, uh, PhDs don't see it. I think it's one of the coolest and most beautiful results in statistics. So I, I personally like this very much. Um, and I think it's very good to see at least once. Um, and it's very, is, is a very influential result that there's a lot of applications for it. Um, so we're going to spend the week on it. Um, a lot of the popular suggestions were active learning. That was one of them. Uh, and then, uh, actually, I'm not sure why we decided to do this, but Larry's going to give a tirade. So next week is going to be, Monday is going to be active learning, because that was one of the most popular topics. So we'll give you an active learning brief. And then Wednesday, Larry's just going to go on a tirade. That's what we're going to call it. And um, was that a suggestion that he made? I'm not sure if he... So he, he's going to tell you about how he doesn't like all the assumptions that people use in theory. So he's going to go through all the assumptions he finds offensive and just tell you why he finds them offensive and how you can get around them. So we've been using a lot of assumptions so far this semester, right? Maybe that's why we chose it. Um, so that'll be the end of the class then. So active learning and then tirade. Um, so Stein stuff. Uh, Stein is a very interesting guy. How many of you guys have heard of Charles Stein before? Just curious. So what would you have heard of him for? About Stein's lemma. OK. Uh, <laughs> well, there, there are actually like three or four Stein's lemmas, so I'm not sure if it's the exact same one. But, but Stein was, um, they're all related. So it's, it's very likely that this, some of this sounds familiar. Um, Stein is still alive. He's at Stanford. Uh, he's about 90, I'm guessing 94. He's pretty old. Um, Stein, in many ways, shaped the landscape of statistics post-World War II. So uh, this result we're going to talk about came from a 1981 paper that he wrote. Um, Stein wrote very few papers. I think he's written something like 20 actual journal papers over the course of his career, which is remarkably little considering somebody who's 94 and has had such a big influence on statistics. And there's this kind of, uh, you know, there's this thought some people say, which is, let's, you know, with all the papers being written today, could you imagine what it would be like if somebody told you you could only publish 20 papers in your life? It was like your life's limit. And you're only allowed 20, so once you get to that point, you can't publish anymore. That would be a very different way of doing things, right, research-wise. But uh, you know, Stein probably wrote, uh, per paper, he's probably the most influential person I can think of in statistics. So he, he really met that uh, quota, and he did a lot. And the interesting thing about this paper is that um, it was actually written a lot earlier than 1981. So there's evidence that Stein knew about this result even in the 50s and 60s. So he wrote papers that kind of referred to this result earlier, but he never published a paper on it until 1981. And actually, in 1974, um, the rumor is that he actually wrote this paper. And he thought it wasn't good enough, and he actually put it in his desk, just put it away in his, in his desk drawer. And one of his colleagues at Stanford, who was his collaborator, um, happened upon this paper. Maybe it was on his, 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 uh, you know, on his front desk or something, and said, can I read this? And he read it. And he was just amazed. And he said, you have to publish this. And Stein said, no, I, he doesn't think it's important enough. Maybe he thought people already knew it. And so what the paper in, that uh, appears in the Annals of Statistics in 1981, um, it was actually, in, in large part, written by someone else. It was Stein's paper that, was, that uh, one of his colleagues took and decided to, this is the rumor, decided to kind of reshape it into a journal paper and put it out in his name. So it's, it's pretty amazing um, when you think about all this, the, uh, you know, the impact this paper has had, given kind of all the, the caveats I just said to you. And it starts off with a very simple observation. And we're going to talk about this, the implications of this observation for unbiased risk estimation. That's going to be the focus of this, this week's lectures. Stein's lemma, the one we learn, actually has a converse. So that might have been one you've heard in probability theory, if you've, if you've taken advanced probability theory. The converse has a huge number of implications in probability theory. So this lemma is, is very central to kind of a lot of important work in statistics and probability. Let's just get to the... Um, the basic univariate result. It's very simple to state, which is that uh, this is what I would call Stein's lemma. And it's that if, if we have just a univariate normal uh, random observation, okay, z comes from standard normal, and you give me a function that goes from r to r. 
And we're going to assume that it's absolutely continuous. So for those of you who don't know what this means, that's fine. Just think about it like differentiable. Continuous. OK, so think about it like f is differentiable. And, or maybe it's differentiable almost everywhere, something like that. It only has a finite number of discontinuity points. OK? If that's true, then this is Stein's lemma. It's a very simple fact. The expected value of z times f of z is equal to the expected value of f prime of z. OK, so because it's absolutely continuous, its derivatives exist almost everywhere. So this is kind of uniquely defined. That's Stein's lemma. So is this what you saw in another class before? This one? OK. So the, the converse to this is actually true uh, in the sense that if, let's suppose this holds for all absolutely continuous functions, that implies that z is normal, 0, 1. So this property is a characterizing property of the, of the normal distribution. If this is true for every, every absolutely continuous function, it must mean that z is normal. And that property has, uh, like I said, that has a lot of implications in probability theory. So Stein's lemma is used in probability theory to prove convergence to normality. There's a, a, a whole almost course you could teach. In fact, I think we don't quite do it yet, but we had a, a whole semester-long reading group we spent maybe it was last year on Stein's lemma in probability theory. We're going to learn the implications of this direction uh, this week. So we're going to first prove this so you, you can see how simple this really is. Um, intuition? Uh, honestly, I, I, this is not a, a situation in which I can give you a lot of intuition. It, it comes right out of the property of the normal density. The derivative of the normal density is equal to minus c times the normal density, right? If you, if you differentiate v of z, so it's e to the minus c squared over 2, right? So I, I don't know if I can give you much intuition beyond that. Um, the fact that this is true for normal distribution, and only normal distribution if it's true for every function, um, that was a very kind of surprising result. I don't think there's a lot of intuition behind that either. But it turns out there's actually a characterizing equation. There's a Stein equation for other distributions as well. So for Poisson random variables, there's a Stein equation. What people discovered for other random variables, there's a Stein equation. So this happens to be the one for normal, the normal distribution. So let's, let's prove this. Um, well, we're going to do it in two ways, actually. The first way is going to be integration by parts. So this is proof one. And the second way is going to be uh, a little longer proof. But the longer proof we're going to see is useful when we talk about the multivariate version of this. Because the multivariate version of this, I guess, is easier proved from the longer version of the proof. So let's just go with the, uh, the left-hand side, right? The left-hand side is equal to the integral. Oh, sorry, we're going to start with the right-hand side. It's the integral of f prime of z, phi of z, dz, right? Where uh, this is the normal density, and that's, that's our function. F, that's the derivative of our function, f prime. And let's use integration by parts. Right? Integration by parts says that uh, this is equal to the product of these two, evaluated between minus infinity and infinity. And I have to subtract off f of z, phi prime of z, dz. OK, so first of all, this is 0. Because this goes to 0 at either ends, right? Infinity and minus infinity. So that, this ter whole term is 0 because, because of the normal density. Now, what's this term? Well, that term. Well, it's the property I just said before, right? So phi is equal to, you know, uh, e to the minus c squared over 2 divided by root 2 pi. And z squared over 2. 
And if we differentiate this, we get that v prime of z, it's just equal to minus z times this, right? So it's equal to minus z times phi of z. So let's use that. And we just see that we get uh, you know, z times f of z times phi of z dz. Pretty, pretty simple, right? Very simple proof. And that's exactly the right-hand side, the expected value of um, or the left-hand side. Sorry, we started at the right-hand side, we worked our way to the left-hand side. The expected value of, of z times f of z. OK, hopefully that's clear. Uh, let's do proof two. So proof two, I guess I'm going to start down here. Just a little bit longer, and we'll go to that board. It's really the same argument almost. It's just that it's written differently. So it's not, it's nothing really uh, too challenging about it. So we again to start with the right hand side. And now we use the fact that um, this is equal to the integral of the derivative of the normal density from minus infinity to z, right? fundamental theorem of calculus, I can always write a function as the integral of its derivative from, say, minus infinity to the point which I'm evaluating it. So I can always write this as f prime of z times the integral from minus infinity. So if I'm leaving off the bounds, it means just from minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to z of, say, phi prime of t dt dz. Right, what this is, um, this I can write as uh, minus t times phi of t, just from the property of <clears throat> what we just said right here. Phi prime of t is minus t times phi of t. And now I'm going to split this up. So I'm going to split this up over the parts where z is positive and where z is negative. So this is equal to the integral from uh, 0 to infinity of f prime of z times the integral from, so this is actually going to be minus infinity to z with a minus sign, but I can actually can get rid of this minus sign and just flip the signs, flip the bounds here, right? And so I get um, z to infinity of t times phi of t dt. And then the second one I'm going to leave alone. Minus infinity to 0, phi prime of z times integral from minus infinity to z of t times phi prime t dt dz. OK. Um, so hopefully we're all clear here. I just, all I did is I split this integral up over this domain where z was posi neg uh, positive and then negative. And <clears throat> Now I'm going to apply uh, Fubini's theorem. Right, so if I'm integrating over all, the set of all z for which uh, z t pairs, for which z is bigger than or equal to 0 and t is bigger than or equal to z, I can rewrite that right, as a set of all uh, t being bigger than or equal to 0 and z being less than or equal to t. And the same thing down here. So I'm just, this is uh, just applying a reparameterization, basically, Fubini's theorem. So I'm going to first integrate over t, so all positive t, t bigger than or equal to z, of this quantity. And then I'm going to integrate over all z that are smaller than or equal to t of this quantity. dz dt. And the second thing for the other integral.
Okay, can you guys all see that? So I just used Fubini's theorem there. And now again, I apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's really all that comes down to it, right? Which is that if I integrate the derivative of a function over two endpoints, I get the function evaluated at those two endpoints. That's all it is. So um, I'll erase proof one and just continue up here. So let's just evaluate that. That's integral from 0 to infinity t phi of t of, we get f of t minus f of 0 dt minus, uh, minus infinity to 0 t phi of t f of 0 minus f of t. No, sorry, f of z. That was right, f of t dt. And these terms cancel, right? So this term, um, well, actually, if I combine this term, see this term say with uh, this term, see that they cancel. Because the, by symmetry of the normal distribution, these are the same thing. And if I combine the other terms, I should get, um, right, I get from 0 to infinity t phi of t f of t. Then I get plus, because there's two minus signs, from infinity to 0, t phi of t f of t. And so all that's left over is the integral of t v of t, f of t, dt. That's proof two. So this is the one in Stein's paper, but it's not, uh, I think, you know, the, the easier proof, I think, was just skipped because the multivariate version is harder to prove that way. Yeah. Oh, that's right. But see, I, then I then I reparameterize. This is this function. Um, right. I'll, I take. I just call minus t u or something like that. So I use kind of a reparameterization here as well. Are you talking about this step from here, yeah, from here to, to here? The from to this thing. Yeah. yeah. So I flip the limits. I get z going from uh, integral going from z to minus infinity. I should have now t phi of t dt, then call u minus t. And so that then it should work out, right? So then, then I'm going from, uh, uh, yeah, that actually, that, that's another way to see it, right? Any other questions? OK. Um, so at this point, this just looks like maybe a, you know, a little nice toy lemma, something that you tell your friends to impress them about why statistics is cool, but, uh, or maybe not. But um, nothing maybe super substantial, right? We're talking about a univariate normal distribution. So, it's a property of, of normal 0, 1. But um, we're going to go, let's talk about a corollary now. Um, I guess I'll go over there. A corollary of this result that we get immediately. It's quite nice, which is that let's suppose x is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And f is, again, absolutely continuous.
by the way, the precise definition of absolute continuity is exactly this one. So it, it's just that a function is absolutely continuous if I can ever take the integral of its derivative and it gives me back the function at the endpoints. So a function is absolutely continuous if there exists a function, which we'll call f prime, for which I can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's how we used absolute continuity. So differentiable functions are absolutely continuous. It just is a little bit more broad because you, you can suppose, suppose f prime didn't exist at some point. That would still be OK. We can still form this integral if, it, if that had just you know, Lebesgue measure 0 or something. So that's why we're saying absolute continuity. Um, so let's suppose x is normal with mean mu and, and uh, variant sigma squared. Then uh, actually, I claim that this result is true. If I take 1 over sigma squared times uh, the expected value of x minus mu times f of x, then that's equal to uh, the expected value of f prime of x. Okay, so this is, this is the corollary of that. Where does that come from? Let's just define z to be equal to x minus mu over sigma. And let's just define uh, the function, it's called f tilde, at a point um, z to be f of sigma z plus mu. And now let's apply this result to z and, and f tilde. Tells us the expected value of z times f of z is equal to the expected value of f times sorry f tilde of z is equal to the expected value of f tilde prime of z. Okay. Um, well, z remember was x minus mu over sigma, so that's where we got this if we only had one of them. Times f tilde of z, but f tilde of z is just f of uh, sigma z plus mu, which is x. And uh, that's equal to the expected value of f tilde prime of z, according to that result, which is equal to, well, we use the chain rule. We see that, that we get a sigma times um, you know, the, the derivative of this function evaluated at sigma z plus mu, but that's x again. And we move the sigma to this side, and that gives us this result. So that's all we've done. Let this be true and apply the previous result. So all of a sudden, we've gone from being, I think, a parlor trick to something that's actually really pretty interesting, um, which is that, let's take a look at this. What is this expression right here? This is equal to, uh, let's say, the, the covariance. You can write this as the covariance of x and f of x. So we said the covariance of x and f of x, once we divide by sigma squared, is equal to the expected value of f prime of x. Let's suppose we knew that z was normal, or x was normal. We didn't know its mean. And f of x was some function that was complicated, some complicated function. And I want an estimate. Suppose I want to estimate this. Don't know the mean of x, but I want to estimate the covariance of x in some complicated function of x, f of x. Well. How would I get an unbiased estimate of this? The covariance is equal to, right, equal to either the expected value of x minus mu times f of x. That's one way to write it. Another way to write it is this equal to the expected value of x times f of x minus its mean. Expected value f of x. Right, Both, those are two different ways of expressing the covariance. Or, of course, it's the expected value of x minus mu times this. 
well, how do I estimate this if I don't know the mean? Because if I want an unbiased estimate of the covariance, of course, that would suffice if I knew the mean. I observe x, I subtract off mu, and I multiply by f of x. That's an unbiased estimate of the covariance. But if I don't know the mean, that's not a feasible estimator. And how about this? Well, um, to get an unbiased estimate from this representation of the covariance, right, I have to take my observed x, multiply by f of x minus its mean. But if f is complicated, this is very hard to compute. Furthermore, this is going to depend on mu. Right? The expected value of f of x is going to depend on mu. So I cannot get an unbiased estimate of the covariance, unbiased one, directly if I don't know the mean. But what Stein is telling us is that let's suppose that x was normal. Even if you don't know a mean, it's mean, it's normal. Then this gives you an unbiased estimate of the covariance. I just differentiate my function and evaluate it at x. That's an unbiased estimate of the covariance. I mean, once I multiply it by sigma squared. So the amazing thing is that it doesn't depend on mu. Okay, you can guess where we're going to want to estimate covariances when we start talking about risk estimation. If you remember our decomposition for risk in terms of training error, the covariance popped up very naturally, just came, came right out. And that's where we're going to use it to do unbiased risk estimation. I think that's, that's a kind of very important aspect of this. So before we get to risk estimation, we have to talk about the multivariate version of the lemma. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's worth proving it. The proof really is very similar to proof technique number two. I don't know. We'll see. I'll just state it first, at least. So uh, the multivariate version says the following. Let's suppose that x is a multivariate normal with mean mu and covariance matrix sigma squared i. Now, the fact that this is spherical is actually really important. Um, you'll see, well, I'll, at least I'll go part, through part of the proof, and you'll see why it's important. So this is very important that the components of x have a spherical covariance. Uh, and let's suppose that f is a function that goes from now rn to r. So the, x is an rn, so mu is an n-dimensional vector, and i is the n by n identity matrix. And as, uh, this function, Stein calls almost differentiable. And so if those of you uh, who've taken functional analysis um, before maybe look at this definition, you might think it looks like the definition of weak differentiability. So they're very closely related. But this is just something Stein made up. All it means is that um, for each i and for almost every x, I'm going to write it like this, minus i, that's an rn minus 1. So this is a point where if I'm fixing uh, n minus 1 of its components. So almost every means with respect to Lebesgue measure, almost every points x minus i, uh, this function, f with all the other components fixed at minus i, so x minus i. What I mean by this is that this function f is a function of n variables. I'm thinking about it as, the, as a function only of the ith variable with all the other components fixed at x minus i. So this is a univariate function, right, from r to r. This function has to be absolutely continuous. Sorry. This goes from r to r. 
this must be absolutely continuous. So th think about this meaning it's, it's basically differentiable. OK, so it maybe seems like a weird definition, but think about it in the following way. If I take any uh, line that's parallel to the coordinate axis, so I pick one coordinate axis, pick uh, coordinate axis i, take a line that's parallel to it, it's defined by this. And along that line, f has to be uh, absolutely continuous. So the function has to basically just be differentiable along that line. Pick any line parallel to the coordinate axis and any coordinate axis. And actually, it's not even any line. It's, it's almost every line. Right? If I take some slices and it happens not to be differentiable at that slice, that's OK. Just can't be um, you know, as many slices to constitute something of non-zero measure. So really, it's just almost every line. So it's well behaved along the directions parallel to the coordinate axis. Um, then Stein's lemma, so let's assume all this. x in this function, Stein's multivariate lemma says that 1 over sigma squared times the expected value of x minus mu times f of x. So let's just inspect this. Look, this is actually in R, this is an Rn. So I'm just taking this and I'm multiplying by every component of x minus mu. This is equal to, well, you can guess what it's equal to, right, based on the univariate version. It's just the gradient of f at x. That's Stein's multivariate lemma for, for a multivariate normal random vector. OK, again, it's, it's quite amazing because um, this is something that's computable. You give me a single observation. If I know my, if I write down my function, I can compute its gradient. This is computable. This is an unbiased estimate for this quantity, which if you try to estimate in any other way, pretty much, it's going to depend on mu, which you don't know. This, of course, doesn't depend on you. You give me an x, I compute the gradient of my function, and that's it. Uh, let me just at least mention the, the proof, the ideas of the proof. Maybe we won't go through all of it so that we have more time for uh, applications. But the proof is, is not much harder than the one we just did, the univariate version. So the, the proof uses the fact that um, so we're going to use the fact that xi and x minus i are independent. And that's true because of this spherical normal distribution. Right? So they're, we know that since the, they have no covariance and they're normal, that means that they're actually also independent. So this is important for the proof. If I fix all the other components of my normal random vector, this one is not affected in terms of its distribution. And um, therefore, we're going to look at this function, f of x minus i. And in fact, I can, uh, I can think about even just conditioning on this, just condition on the value of x minus i, and apply basically the arguments of Stein's univariate um, lemma. And if we do that, we're going to see that the, right, the partial derivative of f with respect to variable i, the ith component of its gradient, say, if I evaluate this at z comma x minus i, phi of z dz, then that's going to be the ith component of this. right? I'm taking the ith component of the gradient, or its ith partial derivative, um, conditioning on the value, say, of x minus i, and I'm integrating with respect to xi. Just follow the arguments that we did before. No difference. Just ignore that and close your eyes if you don't want to see that big x minus i. And you'll see that it ends up being equal to the um, same thing we had before t phi of t uh, f of t comma x minus i dt. Uh, 
And the reason that we went through that kind of more complicated argument using Fubini is that it happens just to be easy to apply absolute continuity um, in that argument. Remember, because absolutely continuous meant that if I uh, integrated the partial derivative or the derivative of the function from one endpoint to another, it was equal to the difference between the function valid at those two endpoints. And here, um, the assumption is that that's true if I fix all the other arguments and look at f as just a function of its you know, ith argument. That was our assumption. That it's almost differentiable along that line. So that, that's just exactly where it comes into play in the proof. And uh, right, what we've shown, in other words, um, well, we can actually see it from here. We've just shown that uh, if I take this and condition on x, uh, x minus i, then it's equal to this, the ith component of this condition on x minus i. Right? Think about all I've done here is I've conditioned on the value of x minus i. You can make it a lowercase x minus i if you wanted to think about it as conditioning. And I've shown that this side in the ith component conditioned on x minus i is equal to this side in the ith component conditioned on x minus i. And then if it's true conditionally, it's true unconditionally too. Just integrate over x minus i. And I have, I've established the ith equality here. And there's nothing special there about the ith equality. Questions about that part? Yeah? Um, well, I mean, that's it's not a bad question. Um, certainly not. So first of all, if we had an unbiased estimator for mu, then it wouldn't be the case that we'd have an unbiased estimator for mu times f of x. My expectation is not uh, linear. So I wouldn't necessarily have an unbiased estimate for this anyways. Second of all, suppose I'm in a setting where it's actually quite hard to do that, or I don't have good estimates of mu. That's really what we're going to use this for. So the goal, the goal at the end of the day is to estimate the mean. That's going to be the old rest of our estimation problem. And in some part of estimating the mean, we need to estimate this thing. Now, if we assume that we had an estimate of the mean to estimate this thing, it's kind of circular. We're trying to assess maybe the quality of our estimate of the mean even that we, that we have. That's a good question, though. Other questions? So um, let's make a final remark, and then we'll take a short break, and we'll see what we've done. Uh, or maybe I'll, just, I'll do it all at once, and then you can take a short break afterwards. So what's the final remark? Um, maybe I should have written that in different notation so as not to confuse you. But let's suppose now that I have x that's normal with mean mu and covariant sigma squared i, and I have a function f that goes from Rn to Rn. So we're stepping up once more. We're going kind of more and more uh, complex in terms of what we're studying. And f I can write as f1 through fn, where each of these goes from Rn to R. So these are its co coordinate functions. Right, each of these goes from Rn to R. And let's suppose that f is almost differentiable, which means all it means is that each one of these guys is almost differentiable. OK, f1 through fn are all almost differentiable. So it's a nice function. Um, if I look at any line component to the coordinate axis and I look at any of its component functions, then they all basically have derivatives there. Then we can actually apply Stein's lemma to this function just by applying it component-wise for each one of these. So all I'm going to do is, look, this is actually um, a set of n equalities, right? Because this is n-dimensional, it's n-dimensional. I'm going to apply this to each one of these functions, f1 through fn. And when I look at the equality for, say, fi, I'm just going to take the ith equality here. 
So I'm going to, from Stein's lemma, I'm just going to conclude that right, there's no need to prove this because it's kind of immediate what, what I'm saying. First of all, Stein's lemma tells us this is true. If I look at fi of x is equal to, that's true for all i. That's just applying that to each one of the component functions. And now I'm just saying, let's just take the ith component of this equality. There's n of them. So all i got to do is look at xi and mu i. That's the ith component here. And look at the ith component of the gradient here. So Stein actually tells us that's true. We've actually lost some, some stuff there. right? We've, we have more equalities than this, but we're just throwing them out. We're not even considering them. So this is true. And therefore, it's true if I sum it up. So in other words, the sum, let's sum over all i, from i equals 1 to n, that's equal to um, the sum here of the expected value. Well, maybe I'll write the sum on, uh, x on the inside, but it doesn't matter. And again, I can actually do the same thing here. I'll write the sum on the inside, but it, it doesn't really matter. Okay, I've just taken the sum, basically, on each side of the equality. And now this should start, start to look very familiar. What have we proved here? We proved that uh, 1 over sigma squared times, what is this? This is the covariance between xi and fi of x. So the sum of the covariances between xi and fi of x is equal to, well, there's not really a great expression for that other than the one we wrote down. This is called the divergence of f. Um, we may write it a little bit differently like this, but it, it's equal to the sum of the partial derivative of the ith component function with respect to the ith variable evaluated at x. What is that? Right, that's the degrees of freedom. So let's think about f. Why do we think about f in this framework? It's because we're thinking about f as taking in an observation, and dimensional observation, and producing an estimate of, of the mean of x. Let's think about that. f is our favorite, most complicated estimator. You, know, you give it in a normal vector, it does very complicated things and produces a mean an estimate of the mean of the normal vector. Right, this could be linear regression. It could be something very fancy. It could be you know, something non-parametric. It, it can be whatever you want. It just takes in, um, say, if we usually think of this as y. So it takes in, say, y instead of x, just so you can get your bearings, and produces out mu hat, our estimate of the mean, or y hat. This is saying that the degrees of freedom of that estimator Right, the covariance, the sum of the covariances between the ith observation, this is the ith fitted value, what we would estimate, is equal to something else. That something else is the expected value of the divergence of our function. And now we're, we're going to just do a little bit of a refresher as to why this is so kind of important slash uh, remarkable, a remarkable result of Stein. Something we did, I think, on my first lecture. We talked about this the very first lecture I gave, maybe the second lecture of the course, which is if we take um, if we take our estimator mu hat, right? Let's let's call mu hat. I'll write up here. Mu hat is f of x. So you give you give me x, I'm going to, f could represent some very complicated 
even optimization problem, I solve to get an estimate of the mean. And I want to know the risk of my estimator. So how, what's the expected square distance between mu and mu hat? Then we did this in, like I said, the very first class, I think, even. We can actually expand this out as follows. Oops. I guess I switched to y. So maybe I was also bewildered by the x here. OK, so maybe we more typically think about it as y, observation vector. So I'm just going to form this very simple risk expansion, which we already did already. I'll just skip the details. Expand this out. Details are in the notes. You'll see that I get n sigma squared. That's for this guy. Plus expected value of y minus mu hat squared. It's from the second guy. And the cross term after you um, work it out is exactly equal to this. 2 times the sum of the covariances between yi and mu i hat. What is that? Look, that's just what we have here. We call this degrees of freedom. Or actually, this is sigma squared times the degrees of freedom of mu hat. And uh, is this a, a term? You don't have to remember it that way, but it's helpful to remember it by name. We also have some interpretations for it, like it told us the effective number of parameters that mu was using when it estimates y. And what did Stein tell us? He told us that actually um, this is exactly equal to, provided that this function f is nice, it's equal to the following. Two times the uh, sigma squared times the sum of the divergence or the expected divergence. This is the expected value, the sum of if we differentiate our estimate with respect to yi and add that up. And we'll go through a few examples so you can get an idea. This may look a bit uh, obtuse or something, but you'll get a sense of that this can be easy to do in many cases. OK, so still, so far, looks like we just exchanged one maybe expression for another. But here's where the unbiasedness property is so important. There's a very easy unbiased estimator of this whole quantity. Right? What is it? Let's take r hat. Let's call this r. That's the risk we're trying to estimate. r hat, I'm just going to take to be, I can forget about the sigma squares, because usually I don't care about the risk up into a constant if I'm trying to let's say, minimize the risk over some tuning parameter. But let's suppose we knew sigma squared for now. Then I'll just form this unbiased estimate. By Stein's lemma, really by this representation for the risk, it, it is so, uh, it holds that the expected value of r hat is r. You can just see it directly from comparing these two equations. So this, this r hat is called sure. Stein's unbiased, unbiased risk estimate. That's that particular form of risk estimate. Questions about about this? Yeah. Remember, in the first class, you mentioned another estimate of this R. Uh, uh, you talked about this in the first few lectures. Right. So I think in the first few lectures, I was saying that we have, if we can e evaluate the degrees of freedom, then we can get an estimate. Like, suppose I had an unbiased estimate for degrees of freedom. 
So I had an unbiased estimate for this quantity. Then I said, well, then we could uh, form an unbiased estimate of r in the same manner. I was actually talking really about this because most of the time, our estimates for degrees of freedom come from this divergence. In some cases, we can evaluate them explicitly. Like for linear smoothers, we saw we can actually evaluate this term explicitly. But in general, this is a much more broad way of doing it. OK. Um, so I'm not going to write it down, but I'll just say it out loud. Uh, it should be kind of intuitively obvious to you now that if mu hat depended on the tuning parameter, suppose I wrote this as mu hat of lambda, then if I wanted to choose lambda, I could try to minimize this overall lambda. Right? If, I, if I wanted to choose a tuning parameter in some way, then one way to do it is to write down Stein's unbiased risk estimate as a function of the tuning parameter and then choose the tuning parameter to minimize that risk estimate. That's something people do quite often, actually. Um, in order for that to be successful, there needs to be two things to happen. The first is that you need to be able to compute this. If you can't compute this for your estimator, then you can't use sure. You have to be able to compute this divergence. So I'll give you some examples of where you can do that. The second thing is, is the more subtle thing. And this is where this connects to what things you've learned already. Actually, even this part connects to things you've learned already. But the second thing is more subtle, which is that uh, we have to know that somehow by minimizing r hat as a function of lambda, that the resulting estimator is still going to have good risk. Right? So let me write it down over here. Let's suppose I were to take r hat as a function of lambda. minimize it over all lambda in some set. In most applications, it would be prudent to then want to say, to want to prove, that this has a good risk property. Just because you minimize an unbiased estimate of the risk doesn't mean that its risk is actually good. Like We would like to say somehow right, that um, r of lambda hat is good. Maybe r of lambda hat should be close to the minimum of the true risk. That would be kind of the eventual goal, right? Or even r of lambda hat should be close to r hat of lambda hat, if we want to say something even kind of closer, because that's what we see. We minimized our unbiased estimate of the risk. It gave us our risk was this number. And we want to say, well, what is the true risk? How different is the true risk from that number? So what does this remind you of that we learned recently? Right, so concentration of measure is exactly what you'd have to use here in order to make sure that uh, this thing concentrates around its expectation uniformly over lambda. If we could show that, then we'd be confident that even if we evaluated r hat at lambda hat, that it would be close to r of lambda hat, which is the expectation right, at, at, any, fixed, at any fixed lambda r hat of lambda's expectation is r of lambda. So a little bit of um, history of what happened after this paper, and then, I'll, then we'll take a break, is that when this paper came out, there was an explosion of interest uh, in this kind of thing. And um, this relates, by the way, to things like AIC, BIC. They're very related to this. Um, but this, in a sense, is, I don't want to say more broadly applicable because um, AIC and BIC each have their own motivation that's kind of beyond the simple forms you see them in regression. But this is a very general idea, right? All I need to do is be able to differentiate some function, and I get a very kind of general class of, of unbiased risk estimates. So there's a ton of interest in this and also connecting it to things like AIC and BIC and cross-validation. And uh, the first wave of papers all looked at simple estimators where this was easily computable. And they gave concentration arguments like this. So they said for things like uh, spline smoothing, s other simple procedures, we can use this to minimize the to choose the tuning parameter, and we can be confident that the risk of that resulting, uh, you know, adaptively selected model is good. And I gave I think five references here, um, six references. So there's a, a 
but these are just six of many. There's kind of an explosion of, of interest in this. Nowadays, uh, people still are interested in Stein's unbiased Chris estimate, but they've kind of forgotten this part. They don't do this concentration argument anymore. And I have to say, I'm also guilty of this. I, I've worked on some stuff that re related to this, and I, I, you know, the papers that I've worked on do not consider concentration. And the, the reason is because uh, when you think about really complicated estimators, actually all the work goes into computing this. So beyond simple estimators like linear smoothers, or other simple ones you've learned, you know, you can write a whole paper on just computing this divergence. Concentration then becomes very complicated because you're asking for a very complicated function, r hat, to concentrate around its mean. So I listed, I think, another eight, ten papers written recently that all focus on computing this for different things. So there's uh, some for, for the Lars algorithm, some for the lasso, some for convex constrained regression estimators, reduced strength regression, singular value thresholding, hierarchical Bayes modeling. So all these papers focus on computing this divergence for different estimators. And then they, they kind of skip this part because it's maybe too hard. Um, so yeah, so my, what my plan was for the rest of the time was to give you examples of this, where you can compute this and what it means. And then to give you an example of where we can prove that it concentrates, just to show you kind of both sides of the, of the story. Let's take a quick break, though, and we'll come back and do the last 20 minutes or so. Um, all right, let, let's, it's, this is a definitely a fun topic, so let's cover this one. And, and if it spills over next time, we can see how much we want to talk about it. So Stein's paradox is, um, in many ways, I think it's kind of like the birth of regularization. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to say the same thing over and over again, but Stein was a very influential guy. And he, he had this idea, which is a very big one, and he also had the idea that shrinkage was a form of controlling the variance, which enabled better estimation, which kind of, I think, in many ways, was, is, you can think of it as, as leading to modern regularized estimation, all the fancy forms of regularization that we learn now. And he has this very surprising result. People call Stein's paradox. Or at least I call it Stein's paradox. I don't know. Unfortunately, Stein has a bunch of lemmas, and so they're all referred to as Stein's lemma. So I'm going to call this one Stein's lemma, and I'll call this result Stein's paradox. Um, and it starts off in this setting. So x is uh, normal mu sigma squared. And it's an rd. I mean, rn or rd doesn't matter, but let's just call it rd for now. And uh, in other words, just to be perfectly explicit, I have d normal observations. that are independent. They each have different means. OK? So d observations, independent, each have different means. Um, let's, before we talk about the paradox, let's establish the ideas of uh, admissibility and inadmissibility. This is maybe something you learned in 705. I'll just remind you of what it means. So um, we say that, uh, let's call it, let's say, inadmissibility first. So theta, say some estimator theta hat. Suppose we're estimating some quantity theta. Somehow I, I really messed up the, the notation here in, the, in my notes. Sorry about that. I'm mixing up theta hat and mu. So let's just stick with one of them. Um, let's say mu hat. So mu hat is our estimate, say, for mu. It doesn't need to be in the normal problem in any problem. I just have an estimate mu hat of some other quantity, mu. And we say that uh, mu hat is inadmissible. So it's inadmissible if uh, there is some other estimate, it's called mu tilde such that the following holds. Um, we have another estimate that has risk 
that's no worse than that of mu hat. This has to be true for all mu. So no matter what the true parameter was that we're trying to estimate, uh, we do no worse if we take mu tilde versus mu hat. And one other thing has to hold. We have to have strictly better risk. So it has to be strictly less than that we get from mu hat for some mu. It could even just be one mu. Right? So it's never worse, and at some point it's strictly better. If this happens, if, if you give me a mu hat and I can find a mu tilde with this property, then we say that mu tilde dominates mu hat. It dominates it. So that means, in some sense, there's no reason you'd ever use mu hat. Because I can always do better, or I can always do no worse, and I can sometimes do better, depending on what the truth happens to be. In this case, we call mu hat admissible. Uh, inadmissible, excuse me. Inadmissible. And it's uh, admissible if this doesn't happen. So admissible means that we cannot dominate it by anything else. OK? So admissibility in, in, uh, is a different concept than, in, than other ones that you've learned. Like, for example, um, we learned when we talked about minimax theory that uh, you know, certain estimators are minimax. That doesn't mean that they're inadmissible, that they're admissible, right? Because minimax is the worst case risk. This is a statement about all risk, risk over all parameters. So those are actually considering different things. This is actually, in some sense, a more thorough uh, notion, because we're thinking about the risk for all values of the parameter. So here's the very surprising result. Let's suppose that. Um, we have these observations. Let's form this estimate of the mean. I'll call it mu hat naught. You give me x. How do I estimate the mean? These are independent observations. They have nothing to do with each other, right? This one was measured, say, in Japan. This one was measured in the US. They're not related. They're completely independent. So if I uh, wanted to estimate the mean, I'll just take x. That's all I have because, you know, they're independent. So I'm trying to estimate his mean and also his mean. All I can do is use x1 and use xd. They're not related. How can I do anything else? That's the most natural estimator you could think of. Here's the progression. d equals 1. We only have one mean. We're trying to estimate it. We use the observation. Admissible. So mu hat is admissible. Means that I cannot find any other estimator to dominate it. That's good, because otherwise it would be kind of surprising. What, what estimator could dominate, as an estimate of the mean, the observation itself? That's, it would be very strange. Um, d equals 2. Two means. You got still admissible. So if I have two means, and they're independent. All I can do in terms of estimation is estimate the first mu of the first observation, the second mu of the second observation. And if I do that, nothing dominates that. There's no estimator that you can form that would have this property. Okay, that's no worse and then sometimes strictly better. This was, you know, back in the 50s, people were interested in proving this kind of thing. And these, this is actually not an easy result. The case for d equals 2 is not easy to show that it's admissible, that there's no dominating estimator. d equals 3. Well, people were trying to prove this. In fact, Stein was trying to prove this. And they couldn't prove it. They just didn't, they didn't know how to prove that it was admissible. And this is the remarkable fact that Stein proved. It's inadmissible. So in fact, there's something that dominates this estimator. Not only that, Stein actually constructed the estimator that, that dominated it. It's called the James Stein estimate. Um, this is true for all d big and equal to 3. 
<clears throat> so let's pause for a second before we, we prove this. Uh, yeah, we could probably do it in five minutes because all it uses is the, the Stein's lemma. Um, it's completely bizarre in some sense if you think about why this is true. We're trying to explain this to your friend. So the example I have in the notes, but there are probably way better examples you can find in some papers that spend time crafting examples. So take a look at the, uh, the papers I listed in the, in the end here. There's some interesting papers on this, retrospective papers. The example I gave is, um, suppose we're trying to estimate the mean number of Justin Bieber records sold in the Bahamas. That's x1. Uh, the mean profit the Trader Joe's makes from its almond butter, that's x2. And whatever my third one was, um, how many deep learning papers are being written each month? X3, OK? Independent. They have nothing to do with each other. I, at least I don't think so, those three things. And I give you an estimate. This many deep learning papers were written this month. And I give you an estimate. Uh, you know, This week, Justin Bieber sold this many records in the Bahamas. And Trader Joe's made this much money on its almond butter. OK, now I want you to estimate all of their means. Well, actually, you should not use the observed number of deep learning papers, the observed number of Bieber records, the observed number of you know, money that Trader Joe's made. That's actually going to be dominated. No matter what the truth is, I can actually give you an estimate that does better. And that comes from uh, Stein's paradox. And the amazing part is that actually it's very simple. And it, it shows you that shrinkage is a really important idea. What we do is we take each of those and the, you know, the example I just gave, we take each of those observations and we shrink them towards, in this case, zero. We can also shrink them towards their, uh, their mean. That would also be a perfectly legitimate estimator. But shrinkage is a something that reduces the variance. And it introduces a little bit of bias. We know that already. But that can be overall good for the MSE. What's amazing is that Stein's paradox actually navigates that trade-off precisely. There's no tuning parameter. There's nothing. It just tells you exactly what the right dominating estimator is for this for this uh, purpose. Um, let's prove it. I could say more and more about Stein's paradox, but let's just prove it. We'll call it a day after that. And if you guys want to hear more about Stein's paradox, we can do a little bit more next time. Otherwise, we'll move on. So what's the risk of uh, the identity estimator? Right? The risk of the, this guy, mu naught, the most natural estimator, is just equal to the expected value of x minus mu in norm squared, which is equal to d. Um, it's actually equal to sigma squared times d. But I'm just going to assume that sigma squared is 1 for simplicity. It doesn't matter what the, really what happens otherwise. Um, we want to prove that. The expected value of the James Stein estimator, which I haven't told you what it is yet, is strictly less than d. That's, what, that's our goal. Let me tell you what it is first. So I'll write it down. Mu hat James Stein. All it does is that it takes x and it shrinks it towards 0 by this amount. So I take x, take each of my estimates of the mean, and I shrink them all towards 0 by this amount, 1 minus d over 2 divided by the, the sum of the squares of x. So um, you can see now that the, the, the observed sample variance of the x has a role, plays a role in how much we shrink. Right? This is my estimator. Um, it doesn't depend on sigma squared. Even for unknown sigma squared, this is what I would use. This is going to dominate the uh, estimator mu hat naught. And we want to prove that. So we want to prove that the risk of this thing is strictly less than d. Well, let's use, um, sure, Stein's unbiased risk estimate for mu hat James Stein. It's a very simple proof we'll see. So um, remember that sure estimate was equal to um, minus n sigma squared. Here n is d. Sigma squared is 1. So minus d um, plus this, the uh, training error. Training error is going to be equal to x minus 
1 minus d minus 2 over the norm of x squared times x squared. It's just the difference between x and our estimate, chaining error, plus uh, 2 times the sum of the partial derivatives of this with respect to xi. So I have to go on that expression, and I have to look at the ith component. You had uh, James Stein and the ith component. Differentiate it with respect to xi. And when we compute this, we're going to see this is actually strictly less than d. And that's going to give us the proof. So um, I'll just do that very quick calculation. I'll go right here. So let's first handle the, the training error term. So the training error that middle term, uh, it's equal to if you just work that out, it ends up being equal to uh, d minus 2 squared over the norm of x squared, right? Because I factor out the norm of x squared. And then all I get is this term squared. And so I get d minus 2 squared over this squared times uh, 1 of it. And so that's why I get just the x squared. That's the first term, very simple. And now let's compute the divergence term. Well, I actually erased the mu hat James Stein estimator, so that's probably not super helpful. but let me write it up again, just real quick. So I want to take this, this squared. All right, that was the ith component of the James Stein estimator, because this is a constant that was uh, that was the vector, right? So the ith component is just this. I want to differentiate this with respect to, to uh, xi. Um, that is equal to just using the chain rule, right? We get uh, this guy, one minus d minus two over x squared, that, um, plus uh, this, we get d minus 2 over x squared to the fourth times the partial derivative of that with respect to xi, uh, which ends up, ends up being um, just 2xi. And I have this xi, so it's 2xi squared. That's the divergence. And therefore, the sum of the divergences, right? The sum of the divergences, if I add this up and I take their expected value, or let's just say, suppose I didn't take the expected value. I just took the sum of the divergences, which is that thing down there. It's the sum of this over all i. So I end up getting, um, this gives me a d. This part gives me a d times d minus 2 over the norm of x squared. And look, this is going to give me the norm of x squared divided by the norm of x to the fourth times 2. So I get plus 2 times d minus 2 over the norm of x squared. And then I can, I can uh, actually simply just combine these two, right? And this is going to give me, just going to give me uh, d minus 2 squared, if I combine these two terms, those two terms. All right. And now I'm going to go ahead and plug in all these quantities, and that'll be it. So for training error, let's read it off. We had uh, this guy, d minus 2 over x squared squared. Uh, 2 times the divergence, I get 2d um, plus, uh, well, that was, sorry, this is an incorrect sign. 2d minus this thing, 2 times d minus 2 squared over x squared. So this cancels with the 2, and this cancels with the 2. And the, the, my risk estimate ends up being d minus something that's always positive, which is actually d minus 2 over the norm of x squared. 
That's r hat. r hat's an unbiased estimate for r. Right? So the expected value of this is going to give me the risk of mu hat James Stein. But we don't have to even compute the expected value. We can just say, look, this thing is always positive. Its expected value is always going to be less than d. So it dominates um, this guy, right, whose risk is equal to d. Without mu hat James, without, sorry, the Stein's, Stein lemma at our disposal, it would actually be a pretty sophisticated calculation to do to compute uh, the risk of mu hat James Stein. Here you can see how easy it is. It was a very easy calculation. The risk is just ends up being d minus this stuff divided by the expected value of 1 over uh, x squared, so 1 over chi squared. That's, you know, maybe sophisticated. We have it at least in, in, a, in a suitable form. Okay, I kept you guys a little bit over. That was it. Um, we'll return to this next time.